Try them again, demanded Frigg from his place in the Ridge Runner's passenger seat. Laria shot the burly miner an irritated look. She made no move to take her hands from the vehicle's controls. The Ridge Runner bucked on its suspension, bouncing them both in their seats and spurring Laria to return her attention to the view beyond the vehicle's vision slit. You want to waste breath? You try them she said. You might notice I'm busy. Freig wasn't doing anything, as far as she could see. He was just hunched dejectedly in his seat, one meaty hand wrapped around his restraint straps, the other tapping a jittery tattoo on his thigh. Everything about the man was irritating her, from his twitchiness to the persistent stale odour of sweat that Laria normally managed to tune out. She couldn't today, apparently. Mind you, it ain't just Freig now, is it? She thought, suppressing a pang of nervousness. Everything has got me on edge these past few days. The others are feeling it too. Emperor Bless and keep us safe. Ah, what's the use? griped Freig. Now that the prospect of making the effort himself loomed, he had evidently lost interest in using the Ridge Runner's Vox. Gamp haven't replied to the half dozen ales. Why should they bother this time? Laria grunted in response. She had a thumping headache. Peering intently out of the vehicle's dust-streak vision slit while concentrating on not tipping them into Stolfort Gulch wasn't helping. The ridge runner banged and bumped along the rocky trackway, and every jolt felt like someone was swinging a mining pick right across the spot between Laria's eyes. Her skin kept tingling, as though something was scuttling across it, and for several days, Laria had experienced a seesaw from watchful paranoia to lethargic disinterest and back again. That alone had left her exhausted. It was odd that Rachnus' camp had gone quiet. In truth, Laria shared Freig's sense of gnawing disquiet about the whole business. Thrule Tertius was an unforgiving world of hidden fissures and whirling grit storms, whose mica-laden winds could abrade a ridge-runner to scrap metal in minutes. It was customary for each mining camp to maintain hourly vox check-ins with its prospector teams. Letting contact slip for even a few hours could have fatal consequences, not to mention attracting substantial punitive tithes from the administratum if proper record-keeping fell behind. Laria jumped as the vox crackled to life and then glowered as she realised it was just Bosk calling from where his own ridge runner trailed twenty yards behind hers. Still no word from camp. Over. Oh, they've been as chatty as a drunk rattling, Bosk. Just none of us figured to cut you in on the conversation, Laria voxed back. She couldn't be bothered to keep the sneer out of her voice, nor to observe proper vox discipline. Not like you, she admonished herself. Only room for one sour mouth in this runner, and Frags claimed that spot. Sorry, Bosk, she added, hating how lame she sounded to her own ears. Can't shift this damned headache, and I'm worried about the camp going quiet. Over. Emperor don't need to forgive what he don't hear, la, Bosk replied, and even this platitude grated on her nerves. And I agree, it ain't right. Over. Laria could have reassured the older prospector, but couldn't summon the effort or the optimism. Instead, she cut the Vox channel and drove on in dismal silence through the whirling dust and the glaring light of Thrull's angry star. 
camp was only a mile away now. It sheltered from wind shear, down between the cliffs of Gulch End. We'll get some answers soon enough, she thought, ignoring the panicked little voice at the back of her mind, whispering about Xenos raiders or Macrotalpa attacks. Laria would find out what was going on, then hopefully she could dispel the stifling sense of oppression that had been weighing on her chest this past week. As she guided her vehicle down the rutted road into Gulch End, her first sight of camp helped Laria breathe a little easier. Sentries in the towers, gates in one piece, no sign of wind damage or rockfall or what not, she said. Call those sentries, being generous, La, commented Frag, dumping cold water over her lifting mood. She couldn't gainsay the big man, though. As they drew closer, it became clear the guards were slouching at their posts, staring disinterestedly over off into the middle distance. Is he actually sleeping? she asked, incredulous at the sight of a militarman slumped over the rail of his watchtower, in full view of at least two of his fellows. Overseer Supter was, as a rule, a stickler for discipline. Seeing such slovenly conduct from his sentries alarmed Laria worse than ever. Got the right idea, grunted Frog. I could sleep like the dead. For some reason, his turn of phrase sent a shiver down Laria's spine. No spoil dust either, she said, pointing with her chin to the clear skies above the camp. Why would they have stopped the dig? Frag offered her an ill-tempered shrug. Ever helpful, she thought wearily. Laria guided her ridge runner down the last twist of the trackway and into the shadow of the camp's prefab curtain wall. The barrier stretched from one side of the gulch to the other, partitioning off the last half mile of the sheltered depression and the bore mine in the cliff face at its rear. Rackness only had one gate, a big metal affair stamped with an aquila and flanked by watchtowers. It felt to Laria as though the sentries took a long while to open it. Servitor guns swiveled to point at her vehicle and at Bosk and Cardi's ridge runner that had just pulled up alongside them. Laria felt a bead of sweat crawl down her temple. The insane thought struck her that the sentries wouldn't hit the saviour runes on their consoles, and that they would simply stare like cattle as the servitors, unaware that these targets were friendly, opened fire upon the defenceless prospectors. She let out a breath as the klaxon sounded. The gate lumbered aside on its servo runners. Laria guided her vehicle between the prefab huts, the chugging the generatorum shrines, and the stilt-legged towers that made up Rachnus camp. The knot in her stomach tightened at the sight of the numerous miners standing about, alone or in little groups, simply staring as though they had forgotten what it was they'd been doing. Others, she saw, reclined on the metal steps of the bunk huts, some of them lying in the full glare of the starlight. Good way to get the scorch, muttered Frag as he followed her shocked stare. The next moment he cried out in surprise as Laria dragged her controls hard right and skidded to a halt. Dust billowed. Grit crunched. The ridge runner rocked on its suspension, then lurched as its engine stalled. What in St. Chet's name? began Frag, but he stopped at the look on Laria's face. Her heart was skipping double time in her chest, and she stared at the rear-view vid-feed on her dashboard as the dust cleared. She breathed out relief as she saw a stumbling figure swim into view. That relief flashed quickly to anger as the man shambled onwards, apparently oblivious. "'That moron just walked out right in front of me!' she spat, slamming her fist against the hatch-release rune, then hauling herself out onto the ridge-runner's roof. Once up there, however, Laria found that her annoyance had already melted into despondent lethargy. The figure stumbled away towards the nearest hut and left Laria more unsettled than ever. What is happening here? she thought, as frightened by how quickly her anger had fizzled out to nothing as by the vacant stares of the miners. Bosk had pulled up beside her, and he and Cardi were clambering out of their ridge runner. She frowned as Bosk helped Cardi out of the vehicle, the youthful apprentice, 
being the most sprightly of them all, normally. Something ain't right, said Bosk, as the four of them gathered beside Lara and Frag's vehicle. I don't feel right. Cardi definitely ain't right, and half these spoil rats definitely ain't either. What's going on here, La? Laria's irritation surged again, but the feeling was comparatively faint. Idly, she noticed that her fingertips were tingling and numb, and she felt cold, despite the pummeling heat of mid-morning. Why should I know Bosk? she asked, and was shocked by the almost pleading note she heard in her voice. Zubta, said Frag, swaying then gathering himself with a blink of surprise. Zubta will know what's going on. They found the overseer of Arachna's camp in his stilt hut. Laria barely managed to muster the wherewithal to clamber up the hut's ladder, while Cardi had to be left at its foot. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, Cardi had assured them, sounded distracted as she lay down in the shade. I just need... And that's all she said. Now Laria pushed open Supta's door. Left a jar, she noted, and found the overseer slumped behind his cogitator within. The smell of the place had made her cough weakly. Several plated meals had been allowed to spoil where they sat abandoned among scattered reports and depleted data sheets. Cold, dusty mugs of recaf sat around the place, skinned with spoil dust and the beginnings of something green. Overseer Supta himself, though, was the main source of the smell. One look told Laria that the man hadn't changed his overalls in several days, and indeed couldn't have moved from his chair for quite some time. Despite the mouldering food surrounding him, Supta was hollow-cheeked and his clothing had a bagginess to it that Laria had not seen before. She was also shocked to see one of the overseer's hands was bandaged. The dressing was in desperate need of changing, fluid seeped from it, and had formed a congealing pool that gummed Supta's hand to his desk. Frigg pushed in behind her, then pulled up short as the sweet smell of corruption hit him. Overseer, you, uh, you all right? he asked, though his tone suggested that Frigg was mildly concerned at best. Though she could see the utter wrongness of this, Laria found herself struggling to care, too. Why did we come in here anyway? she thought, distracted. Supta's red-rimmed eyes swiveled towards them. Team Four, you're back, he croaked. His unwounded hand twitched towards his quill as though he intended to make note of their return, but he managed little more than to brush the quill with a fingertip. Come on, you need answers. Ask about the communication blackout, Laria told herself but the thought seemed somehow unimportant. "'What happened to your hand?' she heard herself instead asking. Supta looked down at the filthy bandages as though mildly surprised to see them. Three days ago,' he said. Three days. Stefan had an episode. Screaming about being watched, about being smothered. Kept shouting about a shroud falling took one of the cutters and wrecked the master fox. I tried to stop him, and... And... Subter trailed off, and his eyes swam out of focus. At least that answers one question, thought Laria. No fox, no fox contact, though why someone couldn't have fixed the damn thing or jury-rigged a replacement was beyond her. Overseer, wh what's happening here? said Bosk, his loud, firm tone making Laria jump. She felt as though someone had dashed cold water into her face, and just for a moment the wrongness of all this rushed back in. Yet her panic was a sickly thing, as malnourished as Supta himself. It quickly faltered again. Maybe something... the rift? asked Supta. Could this be some curse spat from the great rift? thought Laria, steadying herself as her head spun and numbness crept up her legs. Was that what was draining her strength and numbing her thoughts? It was a horrible, insidious notion, but even this didn't stir more than the faintest emotion in her now. Rift's been there a long time. Emperor's kept us safe so far, said Bosk. Frigg gave a grunt of assent, though it sounded distracted and vague. What if... 
Whatever Bosk had been about to suggest was drowned in the sudden roar of an explosion from outside. The stilt hut swayed on its spindly metal legs, shuddering alarmingly underfoot. Old food and sheaves of paper spilled from Supta's desk. A mug hit the decking and shattered. "'The chet was that?' demanded Bosk, his eyes wide. The man clutched the aquila that hung around his neck and stared at each of them in turn. Laria had no answer for him, but instead thrust the overseer's door open again and lurched on numbed legs to the railing above the ladder. She clung there, blinking stupidly, trying to make sense of what she was seeing. Fire leapt and crackled. Smoke billowed. One of the generator had exploded, and now blazing chunks of metal and blackened bodies lay strewn in a wide radius around it. Several of the prefab huts were also ablaze. Even Laria wasn't yet so numbed that she couldn't feel horror at the human figures still slumped upon their steps, even as fires edged in to consume them. Why don't they move? she breathed. Something large shot overhead. A dark streak moving too fast for her to make sense of. The air screamed at its passing, prickling like pins and needles at her deadened nerves. Laria swung her head to follow the moving shape, but before she could make her eyes focus, there came another ferocious explosion, this time directly below her. Caddy, she thought, as fire boiled up beneath her feet, and the ladder buckled and fell. We left Cardi down there. Then she was falling, feeling the sick lurch of acceleration in the pit of her stomach, as the hut's stilt legs bowed and sprayed outwards. Bosk cried out in terror, his voice barely audible over the throaty bellow of the explosion and the tortured groan of collapsing metal. Something heavy hit Laria from behind, and she spilled over the railing. She was too weak and lethargic even to cling on or to try and save herself. The ground rushed up with horrible finality, and she hit with a loud crunch of breaking bone. Metal crashed. Flames danced. Shrapnel span through the air, and the ground shook beneath her ragdoll body, and through it all Laria could only think, I don't feel anything. Why don't I feel anything? She had heard of prospectors breaking their backs, their necks, losing all feeling in their bodies. How that happened to her? But that doesn't break your emotions too, does it? Emperor, why don't I feel anything? Dust and smoke billowed around Laria as she lay unmoving in the dirt. She mustered the strength to swivel her eyes in her head, and saw Frag lying near her, his head tilted at a horrible angle. The big man's eyes were glassy. Blood dribbled from his nostrils and spilled between his teeth where he'd bitten through his tongue. "'Won't be complaining any more,' she thought, now barely coherent. Laria couldn't frame any kind of response when a large, dark shape loomed over her. Thrull's angry starlight glinted on burnished metal, glinted in cruel, lens-like eyes, but Laria was beyond making sense of what she saw. She couldn't bring herself to care when the figure reached down and gripped her by the hair, nor when it turned and began to drag her broken body through the dust towards the dark mouth of the boar mine. It didn't hurt. It didn't matter. All Laria wanted to do was sleep.